Key concept 7.2, uh, the second of three in time period seven, which is focusing on innovations in communications and technology and its relation to the growth of mass culture in the United States between 1890 and 1945 as well as significant changes in internal and international migration patterns. So this key concept is really focusing on two different themes, the first of which is uh, mass culture in the United States, really focusing on the 1920s and a little bit on the 1930s, but really 1920s, as well as immigration and migration, again, really focusing on the 1920s. So whereas key concept 7.1 is uh, progressive era, 1910s, uh, early 1900s, and then Great Depression, New Deal, 1929 to 1940, kind of skips over the 1920s, Key Concept 7.1. This is where we get the 1920s in Key Concept 7.2. So our big idea questions. How did technology transform the standard of living in the United States? We mentioned some of this technology in our notes for 7.1, things like cars, things like radios, um, electricity and the electrification of the United States is really taking off during this time period. So how is this changing the ways in which people live in the country? Our second question, what factors led to immigration restrictions during the 1920s? We have two pretty severe restrictions, one in 1921, one in 1924, which we're going to take a look at. Why did this happen? And third, what caused internal migration to increase drastically in the United States during the first half of the 20th century between 1900 and 1945. So those are our big idea questions for Key Concept 7.2. So Roman numeral one is about pop culture. So pop culture grew in influence in US society even as debates increased over the effects of culture on public values, morals, and American national identity. This should sound familiar because of course this is something that our um, society today struggles with. And this is not something that's new in the 1900s, I should say, but I was about to say 1920s, because it really is 1920s. But what we're going to see is that because of the seismic changes that are brought about around the turn of the 20th century, and especially after World War I, these debates continue in in it and intensify. Ooh, struggled with that one, sorry. Um, so, new mass media helps to spread culture and awareness of regional cultures. So the radio is the classic example here. Uh, War of the Worlds in 1938, Orson Welles. There's a sort of a prophetic story about War of the Worlds. Um, so Orson Welles did a radio program where he was reading War of the Worlds, which is about an alien invasion. And supposedly people tuned in halfway through it and they thought that it was a news report and they thought that aliens had actually invaded the United States. And there's all of these accounts supposedly of people calling their local uh, police stations and saying, oh my God, what are we going to do? Where should I hide from the aliens? The, um, there's very few actual accounts of this happening. But a uh, funny story nonetheless about the power of the radio. Um, fireside Chats, FDR understands the power of the radio for creating support for his programs during the New Deal. Does a series of fireside chats throughout his presidency. I think it's somewhere around 40, I want to say. So um, I guess that averages out to like three a year, somewhere around there. He did a lot in um, his first term as president and, of course, a lot during World War II. Father Charles Coughlin was a, um, a priest, but he actually had a radio program. It reached somewhere over five million Americans. And uh, he was one of the critics of the New Deal that we talked about in um, Key Concept 7.1. So radio is 1920s, 1930s, as is cinema. Hollywood, the movies, um, sometimes referred to as Nickelodeons, uh, because you would pay a nickel to, uh, to see a movie. So if you ever wondered where Nickelodeon, the television station, got its name, that's where it comes from. Movies were seen as a key source of entertainment even during the Great Depression. So when people were struggling to make ends meet, we still saw the growth of the movie industry throughout the 1930s because people had to have an escape. And movies tended to be that escape. On average, people went to the movies once a week, even throughout the height of the Great Depression. The Jazz Singer, um, sometimes this pops up on AP exams from time to time. It's the first movie with sound in 1927. 
and the 1930s, all kinds of good movies, like the classic golden age of movies. You've got like uh, King Kong, The Wizard of Oz, um, Citizen Kane, which I think is like 1941, so that's kind of on the tail end of that. Um, Gone with the Wind is somewhere in there as well. That might be 1939. So they're all around um, 1930 to 1941, these classics of Hollywood. So this is a really good time for the movie industry and the growth of Hollywood. And third, talking about mass media helping to spread culture and awareness of regional cultures. So um, mass media is helping to spread um, the awareness of regional cultures. So the Yiddish theater, I think textbook makes mention of this. Um, portraying the, Amer the experiences of American Jews at a time when Jews were really seen as outcasts in American society. We'll talk more about this in Key Concept 7.3 um, when we look at World War II and um, the anti-Semitism that existed in the United States. Yiddish theater is a really important component of uh, the Jewish community in the United States and spreading that um, culture beyond uh, the regions where Jews tended to live. Um, Yiddish theater also influenced English-speaking theaters later in America. Um, a more well-known example from this time period is the Harlem Renaissance and um, black theaters and black entertainment in general, which we'll um, talk about a little bit more in a moment. So, um, yeah, we'll talk about the Harlem Renaissance in the context of migration and, uh, yeah, not immigration, migration. As African Americans are moving to urban centers, especially urban northern centers like New York, um, you get this movement that arises from that, mostly in the 1920s. Um, the Harlem Renaissance is a celebration of African American culture through writing, music, and art. Famous people associated with the Harlem Renaissance, you should know Langston Hughes, who's that top right picture. Uh, poet, one of the most famous poets from 20th century America. Um, we'll read, I think we'll read I Too Sing America in class, but he has a number of incredible poems. Zora Neale Hurston is uh, bottom right. She's a novelist um, and uh, another prominent figure in the, uh, the Harlem Renaissance. Their eyes were watching God as her famous work from 1937, I think. And we can't talk about the Harlem Renaissance without talking about jazz. Jazz is the first American art form, the original American art form. Jazz is growing out of African American culture, and it's really the first component of um, black culture in America that becomes a part of mass culture in America. Jazz is appropriated by um, white Americans and uh, people beyond our borders. Jazz spreads very quickly beyond the borders of the United States. And it's so popular and influential that the 1920s is sometimes referred to as the Jazz Age. Um, so official restrictions on freedom of speech is also a component of um, of this time period. This is mostly during World War I, also during World War II, but the College Board really focuses on World War I and its aftermath um, with the Red Scare. There's a second Red Scare after World War II, which we'll talk about in time period eight. Um, e examples of this, the Espionage Act of 1917, the Sedition Act of 1918, which makes it illegal, it makes it a crime to um, advocate for the overthrow of the United States government. And you might say, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Um, but this is freedom of speech. At least that's what people are um, are arguing, radical activists, I should say, are arguing. That, um, you know, free speech includes the ability to criticize the government and speak out against the war. Uh, socialists like Eugene Debs are really the ones who are leading the charge in criticizing the Sedition Act of 1918 in particular. The Supreme Court sided with the federal government. It was upheld in Schenck v. United States. After World War I, we have this time period, which really doesn't last for very long, um, early, it's like 1919, 1921, 1922, although there are reverberations of it throughout the 1920s, which is the Red Scare, fear of radicalism, communism, and anarchism. The Russian Revolution, the second one, happens in 1917, the Bolshevik Re Revolution. And um, the Soviet Union becomes the first communist country 
in the world. And there is fear after World War I that this communism is going to spread because, of course, the rhetoric of communism is that it is a worldwide revolution. Workers of the world unite. And there are a lot of Americans who are afraid that capitalism is going to fail, the United States government is going to be overthrown. And this is all happening in a time of increased immigration as well to the United States. And so you get the, uh, the Red Scare in which unions are targeted, immigrants are targeted. The um, famous example here is A. Mitchell Palmer, who is the attorney general, the highest law officer in the land, is actually going above and beyond the legal means to um, target immigrants, deport immigrants. Um, these are referred to as the Palmer Raids because you have police who are using legal search and seizure tactics and who are deporting people without trials. Um, it's a really uh, scary time. I mean, people are really, really afraid of a communist revolution taking hold in the United States. This is also an important backdrop for the Great Depression because you have this Red Scare in the early 1920s. The Great Depression sets in in 1930, 1931. And pe so people are thinking back to this time period. The communist revolution in Russia is less than 15 years old. And people are thinking, oh my God, now the economy is collapsing. We could have our own revolution here. So in the 1920s, cultural and political controversies emerge out of all of this change as Americans debated gender roles, modernism, science, religion, issues related to race and immigration. We could, we could take this, this wording and, um, and put it in today's America too. Um, but the 1920s, because of all the change that's happening and because of this like post-World War I atmosphere, which is an atmosphere of, in some ways, uh, trying to um, focus inward in America, towards America's problems, there are a lot of debates that are going on revolving around American culture and values. So gender roles, um, women are challenging gender roles, especially young, um, middle-class, urban women. Flappers are an example of this, these young women who are challenging social norms. They drank, they danced, uh, they smoked, they went out on unchaperoned dates, they wore dresses, they wore makeup, they cut their hair short. Uh, which you can see in the, the picture to the right there. Um, flappers are really challenging traditional female gender stereotypes. And uh, important to note that there are very few women who are actually doing this. Um, there are very few tried and true flappers, but they're important because they are setting trends. They are encouraging other women to engage in some of these these behaviors, maybe not all of them. A, a good analogy here are the hippies. There are very few hippies in the 1960s, like people who are actually moving to California and quitting their jobs and trying to drop out of society. But they, their significance lies in the fact that they are inspiring others to take on some of their, um, their aura, I guess. And that's, that's where flappers fit in too. So there are very few women who are actually doing all of these things but there are women who are doing some of these things. And um, that's a big change. If you compare women in the 1890s and what was um, seen as stereotypical for women, the flappers are challenging basically all of that. Um, continuing on with uh, women challenging stereotypical gender roles, Margaret Sanger is an important figure during this time period. She's advocating for birth control. Birth control is hugely important when you're talking about um, women's ability to be economically independent. Um, and so uh, birth control is um, is a big one. We'll talk about birth control post-World War II and time period eight as well, and the significance that um, birth control has for women who are seeking um, economic and social independence from men. So modernism, which is another one of the words that appears up here in D. Um, we talked about this in Key Concept 7.1. More Americans are living in cities for the first time in our country's history than elsewhere than in suburban or rural areas, didn't really have suburbs at the time. Many Americans, um, however, are losing their autonomy. They are becoming cogs in the wheel of the industrial society, as it were. And so modernism is this double-edged sword. Americans have more creature comforts than ever. Think radios, think electricity in their homes, think uh, refrigerators. 
But at the same time, Americans have less time and energy to enjoy these things. Um, yeah, I don't need to say much more about it because we still struggle with this today, technology. Science and religion. The Scopes trial is a great example of the clash between science and religion as uh, scientific discovery and inquiry intensifies. Yeah, think like Albert Einstein, who is, um, who is this time period, um, time period seven. You have... Um, religion and religious backers who are challenging uh, science's ability to explain the world around us. Because really, when you think about it, that's the goal of both science and religion. They are trying to explain the unexplainable. So it shouldn't surprise us that they um, come into conflict. The Scopes trial is a good example of this. You have this teacher, John Scopes, who is uh, recruited by the ACLU to challenge a law in Tennessee which makes teaching evolution illegal. So Scopes teaches about evolution. He is, of course, arrested, and he goes to trial, and it becomes a, um, a nationwide sensation where you have, um, you have this small town of Dayton, Tennessee, descended upon by reporters from all corners of the United States who are fascinated to find out um, whether or not teaching evolution should be legal or illegal. What um, do we believe as a country? Um, Williams Jennings Bryan is the one who is prosecuting um, John Scopes. Um, Clarence Darrow is the one who is defending him. Two of the most famous lawyers in the United States, William Jennings Bryan, of course, ran for president multiple times in the 1890s. And uh, Scopes is found guilty, um, although his conviction is overturned on a technicality, I think. But the significance lies in what the Scopes trial says about the debates that we're having. Are we a religious society or are we a scientific society? Which one is more important to us? Another debate that we are still having today. Last and certainly not least is race. Um, the red summer of 1919, we see a number of race riots in northern cities, the worst of which is Chicago. This is also the time when Jim Crow is pretty firmly in place in the South. Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 really paves the way for this. And by the time we get to post-World War I, Jim Crow and legal segregation is the way of the South. We'll take a closer look at that in time period eight. Last, um, and certainly not least, did I say last phrase? Yeah, I hope I didn't. Uh, last is uh, immigration, the rise of nativism in the 1920s. The Ku Klux Klan has a resurgence in the 1920s, and its membership really peaks during this time period. It's going to decrease after the 1920s until the present day. You have a number of Americans who are saying we need to curb immigration, we need to kick immigrants out, we need to protect white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America, which a number of Americans see as the heritage of this country. And the KKK ostensibly is trying to protect that. That's what they say. They're doing it through terrorism and often illegal means or extra legal means. Sacco and Banzetti, two Italian immigrants who are arrested in Braintree, Massachusetts for a murder. They are tried on very weak evidence, but they are found guilty by a judge who is making anti-immigrant remarks during the trial. And they are sentenced to death. And their court case, like the Scopes trial, becomes one of the trials of the decade. Both, both of these trials are happening in the 1920s, the Scopes trial and Sacco and Benzetti trial. And um, it's a national sensation. People on both sides who are arguing for their guilt and for their innocence, and it comes to represent the plight of immigrants in this country, these two Italian immigrants who are anarchists. They are pretty radical people, but um, whether or not they committed the murder is uh, up in the air. But they are um, sentenced to death and they are executed in uh, 1927, I believe. And um, work on, on uh, the Sacco and Manzetti case has not stopped. There was actually some ballistic analysis that was done uh, fairly recently, I want to say within the last 10 to 20 years, on um, the gun that uh, I think Vanzetti had on him when they were arrested. And um, 
I think the historical conclusion is that Sacca was probably innocent and Vanzetti was probably guilty. I think I'm getting that right. So, um, Roman numeral two here, economic pressures, global events, and political developments cause sharp variations in the number of sources and experience of both international and internal migrants. So Roman numeral one is about mass culture. Roman numeral two is specifically about immigration. Um, European immigration reached its zenith, its, its height, prior to World War I. After World War I, you see these nativist campaigns, which we touched on, which are arguing that we as a country need to cut off immigration. And so 1920s is a time that should be associated with some pretty extreme nativism. Um, what ways does this nativism manifest itself? Well, we could take a look at the Red Scare and the Palmer Raids, which we already talked about in the context of mass culture. Um, but we have to take a look at immigration quotas. In 1921, the federal government passed an immigration quota which restricted immigration to 3% of a country's population in the United States. According to the 1910 census, so each year, only 3% of a country's population as it existed in, in the U.S. Census in 1910, could be allowed entrance. This was revised in 1924 down to 2%, and they used the 1890s census, which, as you would imagine, there were fewer immigrants, especially from places like Southern and Eastern Europe, who existed in the United States in the 1890s as compared to the 1910 census. The Immigration Act of 1924's one of the most extreme immigration acts that the United States has ever passed. Um, the Exclusion Acts, Chinese Exclusion Act of 1880 something, 1881, 1883, um, is an example of something that was more extreme. But the Immigration Act of 1924 is more comprehensive than the Chinese Exclusion Act because it excluded immigrants from all of Asia as well as limiting the quotas from other countries of the world. We're talking about Europe here, mostly, um, down to 2% in the 1890s census. So these, both of these acts are targeting new immigrants from Southern and Eastern Europe. And you take a look at the graph here, you can see that the first two decades of the 1900s, uh, immigration is uh, rising, 1881 to 1890, it goes down a little bit in the 1890s. We have the panic of 1893, uh, economy's not looking too great, but look, it shoots up first decade, 1901 to 1910. It goes down a little bit um, because of World War I during this decade. And then look at what happens because of both these acts and also the Great Depression. And so you go from this height of over 8 million immigrants coming to the United States in the first decade of the 20th century down to below 1 million in the 1930s. Now that's not just these acts, it's also the Great Depression, but these acts have a role to play. Um, when we're talking about internal migration, we're talking about the Great Migration of African Americans, which I touched on in Key Concept 7.1, um, but also Americans who are moving due to the difficulties of the Great Depression in the 1930s, and in response to wartime job opportunities in urban areas. Both World War I and World War II led to increased war production uh, for cities, and so people are moving there. Great Depression in the 1930s, people are fleeing the center of the country as well as the south, and they are fleeing to uh, urban centers, also to California. This is when California's population is really going to start to take off. Post-World War II, it's going to continue to take off. And the Great Migration, um, during and after World War I, African Americans are trying to escape segregation and sharecropping in the South, as well as racial violence and limited economic opportunities. Moving to the North and West, primarily urban areas, they are finding some new economic opportunities, but they are still encountering discrimination. Um, the discrimination may look a little bit different than the Jim Crow South. It is a little bit more behind the curtains, so to speak but it is very much still a part of the African-American experience during the time period. So what's uh, some of the reasons? Uh, fleeing from segregation, which is made legal as far as federal government is concerned, in Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, and also racial violence. The KKK is very active during this 
time period, especially the 1920s and 1930s. Um, we'll talk about this in class, but lynchings are a <sighs> lynchings are a fact of life for African Americans um, all throughout this time period in the South. Lynchings are seen as a form of racial justice by many white Southerners in the South, and so blacks are fleeing um, these three things. Uh, segregation, racial violence, and li limited economic opportunities, and they are um, seeking to find respite from this. Uh, they are finding some escape, but not as much as they would have hoped. So, what does this great migration look like in terms of impact? This is 1790 to 1910, the percentage of African American population living in the American South. It is 90% give or take two, three percentage points, from 1790 until 1910, 120 years. Then, during this time period, from 18, from 1900, 19, I guess you say 1910 to 1950, basically this time period, that goes from 89% to 68%. This is the Great Migration. This is what we are talking about here. Now, why is it happening? It's happening because blacks are trying to escape the South. It's also happening because you have World War I right here. Small impact with African Americans trying to find defense industry jobs, trying to escape the Great Depression, but really you can see the impact of World War II here. African Americans trying to find uh, jobs in urban centers in World War II. There's another cool way to visualize um, the first Great Migration is the one that we are talking about here. So this is change in the share of black um, uh, population. And uh, the darker the shade of red, I guess we could say. We have like tan, yellow, orange, red versus the darker the shade of blue. Red is increasing, blue is decreasing. And so you can see where all the areas are that the black population is increasing. Um, almost exclusively in the north, a little bit in the west, a little bit down here in urban areas, uh, places like New Orleans or one of these is Houston, I think. Um, there's a second great migration after World War II, and you see the same trend again here. Uh, blacks are leaving the south. This is where we see the blue. Blacks are leaving the south. This is where we see the blue for the most part, and they are moving north and west in search of a new life. Um, D, this is an interesting uh, asterisk that we have to put on immigration and migration during the time period. Migration to the United States from Mexico and elsewhere in our hemisphere actually increased um, during this time period. The government is pretty ambivalent um, towards hem uh, hemispheric, Western hemispheric immigration, really focusing on Eastern European, Southern European immigration and stemming that tide. Um, many, however, many who came from Mexico and the Western Hemisphere were deported during the Great Depression. But during World War II, the Braceros program was put in place, which encouraged Mexican immigration as a labor source um, during World War II. Many worked as farmers during World War II. You have a little over 15 million Americans who serve in the armed forces during World War II. Many of them are young and leaving the labor force. And so the United States government encourages Mexican immigration through the Braceros program um, during this time period. So between 1942 and 1964, 4.5 million Mexicans came to the United States legally through the Braceros program um, when it was ended. It's important to note that many of these laborers were seasonal laborers, and that's why when we look at this chart, you don't really see a huge growth in the Mexican-born population in the United States until well after World War II and into time period eight and really into time period nine, 1980 to the present is when Mexican immigration takes off. Popular multiple choice and short answer questions from the college board here um, shouldn't surprise us. Changes in technology, um, car, radio, movies, causes of cultural and political conflict, um, think modernism, flappers, gender roles, science versus religion, um, immigration, all that stuff. Harlem Renaissance, Red Scare, the Immigration Acts of the 1920s, and the Great Migration. Um, and essay questions, migration opportunities, uh, why people are moving. Uh, 
to the United States in the United States. Um, comparing the 1920s to another decade, very popular to compare the 20s to the 50s. Um, both both po post-World War um, time periods, both times when Americans are really concerned with like creature comforts and American issues. So there's a lot of comparisons to be made there. And um, cultural conflicts of the 1920s, just because there's so many of them, it's a popular essay question because there's a lot for students to write about. Okay, so that's key concept 7.2, which is focusing on two themes, um, mass culture in the United States, mostly the 1920s, and immigration and migration.